Lieutenant Bill Bianchi, a 27-year-old officer with dark hair and a friendly yet secretive smile, stepped quietly, his rifle raised, through the dense undergrowth and vines that covered the baton jungle floor and concealed him from the enemy. Between the foliage and the dense bamboo thickets, he could see only about 10 yards in front of him, and that was particularly detrimental since he was leading a platoon of infantrymen toward a hidden Japanese machine gun nest. With such limited visibility, he had to rely on his other senses, such as the sounds of the machine gun bullets speeding through the air and foliage. Suddenly, two of those bullets hit their mark, striking the young lieutenant in his left hand, ignoring the wounds and refusing to seek medical aid. Bianchi tossed his rifle aside and pulled out his pistol, which he could shoot with just his right hand. He waved his platoon forward toward the machine gun nest, which had spotted and was now concentrating fire on them. Grabbing a grenade, Bianchi pulled the pin and tossed it into the nest. The explosion silenced it. He then directed his platoon toward a second machine gun nest. A second firefight ensued, and Bianchi was again struck by two bullets, this time in his chest. And again, he refused to draw back. But the barrage of bullets coming from the nest grew fiercer, and Bianchi searched around his position, desperately seeking a way to destroy the nest. Then, he spotted an American tank. Despite his bleeding wounds, he jumped up on the tank and took control of its anti-aircraft gun. He fired on the nest, the anti-aircraft ammunition destroying it. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, a bullet fired from close range struck Bianchi. The impact threw him off the tank. He landed hard on the ground. And this time, he didn't get back up. This is Left Behind. Welcome to Left Behind, a podcast about the people left behind when the U.S. surrendered the Philippines in the early days of World War II. I'm Anastasia Harmon, and I tell you the stories of World War II servicemen and women, civilians, guerrillas, and others captured by the Japanese forces in the Philippines. My great-grandfather, Alma Sam, was one of the POWs, and his memoir inspired me to tell stories of his fellow captives. This is the fourth and final episode in our series about the three Congressional Medal of Honor awardees during the Battle of Bataan. In this episode, I'm focusing on Minnesota native Willibald Bianchi. If you haven't had a chance to listen to the other recipient stories, I highly recommend listening to episodes 16 through 18. They aren't required listening for this episode, but there is a reason each man received America's highest award for combat valor and their stories are definitely worth the listen. School's out for summer. Cue Alice Cooper. With school out, my three awesome, noisy, messy kids are at home all day, every day, which means my time has become more limited because as great as my home studio is, it's no match for three active elementary school kids who like to argue with each other over everything. I get up with the sun to record these episodes, and even then, there's no guarantee I won't be interrupted by someone looking for food, because for some reason I'm the only one who can pop an ego into the toaster. But I digress. For the next couple of months, I'll be releasing a new episode every other week. This episode airs June 12th, 2023. The next episode will air in two weeks on June 26th, and then so on through late August. Spacing out these episodes over the summer gives me the time to research and produce episodes that honor these individuals in the most appropriate way. And now, with that housekeeping info out of the way, let's jump into the life and times of Bill Bianchi. Willibald Charles Bianchi, or Bill as he was called, was born in the rural town of New Ulm in southwestern Minnesota. His parents, Joseph and Carolina Bianchi, were both first-generation German-Americans. Joseph's parents emigrated from Germany in the 1850s and 60s and settled near New Ulm, Minnesota. The majority of New Ulm residents, in fact, had German heritage. The town was settled in 1854 by German immigrants to the United States. Young Bill was raised on the family's dairy and poultry farm with his four sisters, one older and three younger than him. 
The farm did well enough that by 1930, the Bianchi family had a live-in housekeeper and a hired man. Their home and property were worth $39,000. This property value really caught my eye because it's way more than I usually see for home values in 1930. By the way, this information came from the 1930 U.S. Census, where you too could find the value of your family's U.S. home or rent. Anyway, I usually see single-family homes in the $5,000 range, give or take a thousand or so. Thus, a $39,000 value intrigued me. I went back to double and triple check that I read and recorded the right amount, and I did. From what I've been able to find, the median U.S. home value in 1930 was about $4,500. That amount fell a good 35% by the late 1930s because of the Great Depression. The median U.S. home price in 2022 was around $428,000. So adjusting the Bianchi's 1930 property value for today, I think we're looking at their rural property being valued around $3.5 million today. Now that's just some quick figuring by me. I couldn't find a good comparison or reference online. Regardless, it seems that the Bianchis had a rather large farm and dairy operation. In interesting contrast, the Bianchi farm was right next to the Brown County Home for the Poor. Poor houses or farms were precursors to welfare and social security, and they often became home to the area's paupers and disabled. Opened in 1907, the Brown County Poor Farm included a two-story brick building and residents helped produce milk, eggs, beef, pork, and chickens, and worked in the gardens. The farm closed around 1965. In 1932, when Bill was 17, his father Joseph died. With his father's passing, the teenager had to fill his father's void on the farm. And considering the property's value, that void was rather large. However, sometime in the later 1930s, Bill moved with his mother and sisters into New Ulm town proper. But whatever affluence they may have had doesn't seem to have come with them. In the late 1930s, his mother worked at a pastry bakery and his sisters as sales ladies for a cosmetic company and a dress shop. Bill himself worked as a print shop janitor. His mother recalled, he worked his way through South Dakota State Agricultural College. He was graduated in 1940 with a lieutenant's commission in the ROTC. After graduation, Bill spent time at a military training camp in the United States. I don't know for certain where this camp was, but a letter Bill wrote to an army friend in summer 1941 makes me wonder if that camp was in Florida. In that letter, Bill asks a friend if he remembers a nurse that they met in Daytona, one Miss Ellie Morrison and he tells his friend that she writes to him every once in a while. Now, the timing of that letter makes me think that Daytona could have been near where the training camp was. Just a guess, though. In spring 1941, he was then ordered to the Philippines. En route to the island nation, he sent a postcard to his family. Dear aunt and uncle, traveling first class aboard this ship for Manila, P.I. Having a grand trip so far, stopping two days in Hawaii. Say hello to Aunt Lizzie for me. Hope everybody is well, Willibald. In fall 1941, Bianchi was promoted to first lieutenant and became commanding officer of Company D in the Philippine Scouts 54th Infantry. As you likely know from previous episodes, the Philippine Scouts were highly trained U.S. Army units made up primarily of enlisted Filipino servicemen with American officers. Shortly after Bianchi's promotion, World War II began. Lieutenant Bianchi and the 45th withdrew to the Bataan Peninsula in late December 1941 with the rest of U.S. forces on Luzon, which is the Philippines' largest island. U.S. forces initially established a front line near the coastal town of Abuque, where first Medal of Honor recipient Alexander Nininger was killed in action. I highlighted his story in episode 16. However, by late January 1942, U.S. military leaders deemed the Abuque Line indefensible and abandoned it. Thus, American and Filipino forces withdrew south to form the new Orion Bagak Line. This line stretched from the town of Bagak on the western side of Bataan eastward to the town of Orion on the eastern side. It was just over 10 miles long and basically cut across the peninsula's middle like a belt. It also reduced the area of Bataan held by U.S. forces by almost 
General Douglas MacArthur declared this would be the last stand. There would be no retreat from this new line. He wrote to the officials back in Washington, D.C. With this new line's occupation, all maneuvering possibilities will cease. I intend to fight it out to complete destruction. That's my not-so-great MacArthur impersonation. He tended to draw out his vows, at least according to the audio clips I found, like this one from his farewell address to U.S. Congress in 1951. That old soldier never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballot, I now close my military career and just fade away. Within four days of the withdrawal, most American and Filipino troops were in their places along this new Bagak Orion line. It was a heavily forced jungle region with dense undergrowth. Temperatures averaged 95 degrees, even in the shade, with high humidity. However, when the sun set, the temperature dropped significantly and the hot, sweating men spent the night shivering in their blankets. The retreat to the Orion Bagak line had been hasty and many units lacked equipment to quickly dig into their new positions. Some servicemen had to dig foxholes with their mess kits. Adding to the difficulties, the front line ascended up and then down the rugged saddle ridge that connected two Bataan Mountains. Bianchi and the 45th Infantry were on the western side of the line. However, U.S. generals decided that the 45th would be one of the three reserve units held at the rear of the line. General Masaharu Homa, who was over all Japanese forces in the Philippines, ordered his forces to attack fast before the Americans could completely regroup on the new line. Following orders, Japanese troops attacked the western side of the American line beginning on January 26th. Their attack came so quickly that U.S. forces were still stringing wire when the Japanese began firing. The Japanese probed the American line, searching for a weak spot where they could break through. They finally found that spot on the night of January 28th, 29th. That night, a couple thousand Japanese soldiers broke through the American line moving through the gap and advancing into the thick, confusing jungle terrain. Visibility in this area was limited to 10 to 15 yards, but instead of creating a tactical advantage for the Japanese, the line breakthrough created a chaotic situation. Japanese troops were unable to contact their superiors on the Japanese side of the line, and American leaders didn't realize just how many Japanese troops got through the line. The American line quickly fortified itself, leaving those 2,000 or so Japanese trapped in three defensive areas known as pockets about a mile behind the front. On the first day after the breach, an American colonel sent two companies to clear out the area, thinking that only a relatively few Japanese had gotten through the line and were basically blocking a trail. The ferocity of the Japanese counterattack disabused him of that notion and he realized the full size of the Japanese forces. Thus, the 45th Infantry, 1st Battalion, including Bianchi, was called out of reserve to fight against these pockets. Fighting had to be hand-to-hand -hand because artillery was useless in the dense jungle. For days, the Japanese in the pockets resisted U.S. attempts to root them out. But Japanese soldiers had bigger problems. They did not have access to supplies. Food and ammunition were running low. Japanese leadership tried dropping parachutes of supplies inside the pockets, but most fell into grateful American and Filipino hands instead. Still, the Japanese in the pockets fought on fearlessly. By the fifth day of fighting, the American and Filipino forces had not been able to reduce the pockets. So, they called in a four-tank unit on February 2nd that would be supported by a platoon of Philippine scouts from the 45th Infantry. That day, the tanks and infantry cut through a portion of the big pocket but made little overall gains and lost one tank. The next day, February 3rd, a platoon of 45th Infantry Scouts was assigned to destroy two machine gun nests in the big pocket. Lieutenant Bill Bianchi wasn't assigned to that platoon, but he volunteered to lead part of it. The sources aren't clear on whether they had tanks with them. Of Bianchi's actions that day, General MacArthur said, when the rifle platoon of another company was ordered to wipe out two strong enemy machine gun nests, Lieutenant Bianchi 
voluntarily and of his own initiative advanced with the platoon, leading part of his men. Early in the conflict, two bullets hit Bianchi's left hand, preventing him from using his rifle, which required two hands to fire. Not missing a beat, the young lieutenant threw away his rifle, drew his pistol which he could handle with one hand, and continued to lead his platoon. A newspaper later reported, The platoon sought out an active machine gun nest, which fired on them as they approached. Grabbing a grenade, Bianchi pulled the pin and tossed it into the nest, silencing it. He then directed his platoon toward another machine gun nest, which they fired upon. During this gunfight, Bianchi was wounded by two bullets to the chest. However, he kept on fighting. Meanwhile, the tank supporting them was, quote, unable to lower the muzzle of its 37 mm gun sufficiently, and was having difficulty reducing the other machine gun nests nearby, close quote. Now, alternatively, another source says that this tank was already disabled, having hit a landmine on the previous day. Either way, there was a tank near Lieutenant Bianchi. So, despite the wounds in his left hand and his chest, Bianchi climbed on top of the tank and fired its anti-aircraft gun at the machine gun nest, which he silenced. He continued firing into enemy positions until a bullet fired from close range struck him, knocking him completely off the tank. This time, the wound was serious, and he didn't get back up. But the battle continued raging around the down lieutenant. For two weeks, U.S. forces continued fighting Japanese forces that were trapped in those three pockets. They were called the Little Pocket, the Big Pocket, and the Upper Pocket. Thus, the battles at these locations became known collectively as the Battle of the Pockets. I put a map of the pocket area on Facebook. The link is in the show description. U.S. forces started with the Little Pocket, where they trained their tanks and ammunition in a constant barrage. After a week of this never-ending onslaught, the Japanese in the Little Pocket were running low on food and ammunition. In a last desperate attempt for freedom, the Japanese leaders led their remaining troops through a small opening in the otherwise tight Filipino lines around the pocket on the night of February 9th. Once they had escaped the little pocket, the Japanese troops headed north toward the front line, only to be caught in a crossfire with American and Filipino forces. Instead of surrendering, the hopelessly outnumbered and trapped Japanese opened fire and were completely annihilated. I've mentioned this before, the Japanese military code at the time basically forbade surrender. Many units, including this one, fought to near or total annihilation. I find it incredibly tragic to think about. The little pocket eradicated, US forces put all their attention on the big pocket. However, by this time, the Japanese general in charge of the big pocket had been ordered to fight his way north and past the American line. So, the hungry, exhausted Japanese troops pushed their way north and east into a small, narrow area where American Filipino fire from either side of the pocket would be in danger of hitting the other side. It was also an area where the American Filipino line was weakest because of the thick, dense, steep jungle terrain. The weak, starving Japanese who had been eating horse flesh and tree sap were worn out by the two weeks of jungle fighting. With them were more than 100 wounded men who had to be carried out. But other than their wounded, the retreating Japanese were traveling light, leaving behind horses and mules, 300 dead Japanese soldiers, 150 graves, as well as weapons and ammunition. They eventually made it past the U.S. line and to safety after a horrendously difficult four-day march. For the U.S. side, two pockets were down and they had one to go. The U.S. forces turned attention to the upper pocket, which was surrounded by jumbled mazes of dense bamboo thickets, vines, creepers, and other dense undergrowth that prevented the American tanks from breaking through. War historian Lewis Morton wrote, The tankers would have been impotent had it not been for the aid of the Igorot troops of the Philippine army. Hoisted to the top of the tanks where they were exposed to the fire of the enemy, these courageous tribesmen from North Luzon chopped away the entangling foliage with their bolos and served as eyes for the American tankers. From their position atop the tanks, they fired at the enemy with pistols while guiding the drivers with sticks. And within several more days, the upper pocket had been cleared of enemy forces. By the end of the Battle of the Pockets, the Japanese 20th Infantry had been nearly eradicated. 
They had started the Bataan campaign in early January 1942 with nearly 2,700 men. Between the Battle of the Pockets, the Battle of the Points, which I covered in episodes 13 and 14, and other skirmishes, by mid-February, they were down to maybe 650 men. That's just 25% of their original fighting force. The rest were lost in the first six weeks of Bataan fighting. That's just incredibly horrendous. Despite the gains Filipino and American forces had with the pockets, the battle for Bataan was not going well. As I explained earlier, they just had to withdraw halfway down the Bataan Peninsula and surrender 50% of the land they'd held. Plus, their own food, ammunition, and medication were dwindling. Since the outbreak of war, MacArthur and other American leaders in the Philippines had promised their troops that reinforcements from the United States were on their way. But the attack at Pearl Harbor had destroyed the fleet that would have brought reinforcements, and the Japanese had set up a naval blockade around the Philippine Islands. As February continued, it became increasingly obvious that help wasn't coming. A February 12, 1942 CBS News broadcast stated, There is a feeling here that the final hour of trial for MacArthur's men is now at hand. The fight for Luzon has continued 65 days. No one here any longer speaks about reinforcing the men in the Philippines. And for what material can get to the Far East, other areas with more chance have priority. There's little speculation about MacArthur's chances of evacuating. It's believed by many that the small group will first try to withdraw the, to the Corregidor Fortress in Manila Bay. That fortress probably could withstand a fairly long siege, but it's recognized that, that would be defiance without hope. Back in New Ulm, Minnesota, Bianchi's mother soon received word of her son's actions of February 3rd. He's always been a fighter, she told a local newspaper. A few weeks after those actions, Lieutenant Bill Bianchi was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was the third and last serviceman fighting on baton to receive the high honor. The medal citation reads, For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty in action with the enemy, First Lieutenant Bianchi voluntarily and of his own initiative advanced with the platoon leading part of the men. When wounded early in action by two bullets through the left hand, he did not stop for first aid but discarded his rifle and began firing a pistol. He located a machine gun nest and personally silenced it with grenades. When wounded the second time by two machine gun bullets through the chest muscles, First Lieutenant Bianchi climbed to the top of an American tank manned its anti-aircraft machine gun, and fired into strongly held enemy position until knocked completely off the tank by a third severe wound. The Medal of Honor citation was presented in March 1942 to Bianchi himself, who was recovering from his wounds at a Bataan battlefield hospital. Later that same month, Bianchi returned to active duty and rejoined his unit in the battlefields just weeks before Bataan fell to Japanese forces. Bianchi became a prisoner of war and was forced into the nearly 70-mile Bataan Death March. For the next nine months, Lieutenant Willibald Bianchi was considered missing in action. And it wasn't until December 1942 that his mother got official word from the U.S. War Department that her son was a POW. It would be another 10 months until she received word directly from Bill himself. It came as a postcard form letter telling the family that he was imprisoned at the Cabanatuan POW Camp No. 1 in the central part of Luzon Island. He sent his love to his grandparents and sisters and stated that he was in excellent condition. Many families of POWs in Japanese prison camps received letters similar to this postcard. You see, these highly censored cards were fill in the blank, so to speak. POWs could indicate their responses regarding the following. My health is excellent, good, fair, poor. I am injured, sick in hospital, under treatment, not under treatment. I am improving, not improving, better, well. On nearly all the postcards I've seen, the POWs reported that they were in excellent health. These reports were, in pretty much every case, inaccurate at best. The information was completely false in most cases. I look at these form letters as Japanese leadership trying to show the world how well POWs were being treated. The reality of the POW situation at Kabanatuan was bad. 
POWs at this camp suffered from starvation and related diseases. They were worked like animals and beaten for minor infractions, like buying food from local residents. Thousands of POWs died at Kibanatuan. But Bianchi's mother could very well have believed that her son was in excellent condition. You see, New Ulm, Minnesota became the site of a camp for German POWs. U.S. officials turned a former Civilian Conservation Corps camp located on the Cottonwood River into a camp to house German POWs. The location is today known as Flandrau State Park. The camp housed about 160 German POWs, most of them former Luftwaffe, German Air Force men. They used the CCC barracks for the mess hall, clubhouse, and housing. The camp also boasted a sports field and a furniture workshop. POWs worked at a nearby cannery, at brick and tile factories, at a poultry processing plant, and at local farms as farmhands. When not working, they swam and fished in the Cottonwood Lake. The new Ulm residents, who you'll remember were mainly of German heritage, were friendly with the POWs. Many residents of the new Ulm community spoke German, so they could easily converse with the POWs and ask questions about friends and family still in Germany. Town residents would slip food to the POWs, share ice cream and beer during factory breaks, and young women sometimes came to the camp fences to flirt with the POWs, most of whom were around 18 to 25 years old. Security seems to have been somewhat lax at the camp. The POWs could leave camp for work assignments. And while they weren't supposed to leave at other times, unapproved unsupervised out-of-camp excursions did happen. In one documented case, a new Ulm couple picked up a POW they were friendly with, took him to church, and then had him over for Sunday dinner. When they dropped him off that evening at the camp gate, the American guards were surprised and annoyed. The couple was fined, but rumors say these out-of-prison sojourns were common occurrences. It was just this couple's unfortunate luck that they were caught. Well, back in the Philippines, after nearly two and a half years at Cabanatuan, Bianchi received word in October 1944 that he and another 1,600 POWs would be transferred to a work camp in Japan's mainland. A couple days before departing Cabanatuan, Bianchi wrote an uncensored letter to his mother and gave it to a friend remaining at camp. Dear mother, I am writing this letter in case the bearer, Captain Hans Hornbossel, has the opportunity to send it to you. We, the American prisoners here at Kabanatuan, will leave for Japan in a day or so. If we ever get there remains in God's hands. I'm going to confession and communion just in case. We sure had a rugged time so far and we all expect it to get worse before the end. Nearly all of us have become fatalists after going through what we have, but we're not complaining. You have to excuse this writing, but for two years I couldn't write at all. I was wounded in my right arm among other places. My ulnar nerve was severed. It's coming back slowly. I received one box and one letter from you. The letter had 25 pictures in it. A flight of American planes flew over the 21st of September. Sure put us in good spirits. The food here has been very scarce. Very little meat, most of the time none at all. No flour, grease, or medicine. Thousands have died. I used to be in charge of a burial detail. We buried as high as 40 a day. I'm nearly out of ink, so we'll close hoping this letter will find you healthy and happy. You can use my back pay and insurance to make yourself happy and secure in your old age, in case I don't return. Your son, Willibald Bianchi. This letter eventually reached Bianchi's mother, so that friend must have been able to return home, because a letter like this would have never made it past the Japanese censors. A few days later, Bianchi and the majority of the other Cabanatuan POWs boarded trucks for Manila. After spending several weeks at a prison camp in the city, the more than 1,600 American POWs were loaded onto a Japanese transport ship named the Oroko Maru, which sailed from Manila in mid-December 1944. An American plane bombed and sunk the unmarked ship on December 15th, just off the Philippine coast. Most of the POWs, including Bianchi, were able to swim to shore. The Japanese then put the POWs on two transport ships, which sailed to Takao, Formosa, in present-day Taiwan. In Formosa, all the POWs were transferred to the ship in Nora Maru, and they waited in the ship's hold, in temperatures up to 120 degrees, with little food, 
poor ventilation and horribly unsanitary conditions for two weeks. And then another U.S. plane, not knowing what was in the cargo holds of the unmarked Japanese ship, dropped a 1,000-pound bomb on the ship. Bianchi was among the approximately 300 to 500 POWs killed instantly. He was nearly 30 years old. After the war's end, the U.S. Army Quartermaster General's Office began investigating what happened to the remains of the men killed in the Enora Maru bombing. A 1949 letter to Bianchi's mother explained, During one of the attacks by American bombers in Takao Harbor, approximately 300 prisoners of war were killed. Two days later, the Japanese had the remains of the dead loaded on barges and taken ashore at Takao, where they were interred in mass graves. This letter says around 300 POWs were interred in the mass grave. Other sources say 483 bodies recovered from the Enora Maru wreck were interred there. In 1946, Quartermaster General representatives exhumed the mass grave. The letter to Mrs. Bianchi continued. These graves have since been located and the remains disinterred and taken to the U.S. Army Mausoleum, Schofield Barracks, Territory of Hawaii, by our American Graves Registration Services. But, and this is morbid, the remains were so intermixed that few of the individual remains could be positively identified. The Quartermaster General's office knew that Bianchi was interred in the mass grave at Takao because survivors of the Enora Maru testified that he was. A picture of the mass grave site was printed in several U.S. newspapers in 1946 and included this caption. A mass grave for 483 Americans on a Formosan beach brought back tragic memories for Major Robert Kahn, one of the survivors of the Jap hell ship Enora Maru. Kahn said he turned over to the War Department information positively identifying two Minnesota men buried in the grave, including Lieutenant Willibald C. Bianchi, New Ulm Congressional Medal of Honor winner. So basically, this officer indicated to the Quartermaster General's office that he was an eyewitness to Bianchi's burial in this grave. In 1949, the Army Quartermaster General's office determined that Bianchi's remains could not be identified. They ordered that a letter should be written to Bianchi's mother, Carrie, explaining the findings and that The letter written should contain all facts possible and should not be a short tape letter. The deceased is a conspicuous hero in his small town. That letter was written on September 21, 1949. It read, in part, Dear Mrs. Bianchi, The Department of the Army desires that you be informed of the final determination of the investigation in the case of your son. The circumstances surrounding the death of your son have been thoroughly reviewed, and although it has not been possible to prove physically the identification of your son, and as it is not possible to establish individual identity of most of these remains, they will be interred in a United States military cemetery overseas where they will be perpetually cared for. Realizing the extent of your grief and anxiety, it is not easy to express condolence to you who gave your loved one under circumstances so difficult that there is no grave at which to pay homage. May the knowledge of your son's honorable service to his country be a source of sustaining comfort to you. Thus, Captain Willibald Charles Bianchi's remains are considered non-recoverable and his official status is missing in action. The remains from the mass grave were eventually interred in 20 communal graves at the National Cemetery of the Pacific, commonly known as Punchbowl, in Honolulu, Hawaii. So that is most likely where Bianchi's remains rest today. I say most likely because there is always a chance that he was never in the mass grave despite the testimony of survivors. In 1976, Punchbowl erected a cenotaph, that's a memorial grave marker placed on a grave containing no body, in Bianchi's honor. His name also appears on the tablets of the missing at Manila American Cemetery. Another investigation regarding Bianchi was going on at the same time as those into his remains. In 1948, his mother wrote to the Quartermaster General's office regarding her son's POW diary. My son, Captain Willibald Bianchi, was in prison camp number one, Cabanatuan. As I understand, he wrote a diary. He was in charge of the galley there. Colonel Johnson told my daughter that he was with my son as prisoners, and when they were transported to Japan, or rather before they left for Japan on a prison ship, Bill buried the diary in a can. 
If there would be any chance that this diary might have been found, it would mean so much to me to receive something of Bill. With the letter, she included a rough, hand-drawn diagram of the supposed burial location, as well as a handwriting sample of Bill's. I don't know which of Bill's four sisters heard the diary information, but I do know that his younger sister, Germaine, was a lieutenant in the Army Nurse Corps during World War II. She spent two years in the Pacific, with at least part of her time being in the Philippines. I suspect she served there during the later years of the war, when the U.S. had retaken the island nation. So I wonder if she's the one who heard the diary burial information. The Quartermaster General's office attempted to locate Bill's diary, but were unable to do so. In a letter to Mrs. Carrie Bianchi, they stated, A further effort to locate the diary was considered impractical in a view of the fact that the map, which you furnished, is inadequate on which to attempt a search, as the Cabanatuan prisoner of war camp has been completely destroyed, and the area formerly occupied by the camps has been entirely covered by a dense growth of native Congan grass. Another incredibly tragic blow for this mother who lost her only son. In May 1946, more than four years after Lieutenant Bianchi first received the Medal of Honor citation, and nearly one and a half years after his death, Captain Willibald Bianchi's Medal of Honor was presented posthumously to his mother at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. Today, Bianchi's Medal of Honor is located at the Brown County Historical Society Museum in his hometown of New Ulm, Minnesota. All of Bill's sisters married and lived into the early 2000s. Through them, Bill has more than 14 nieces and nephews, and upwards of 19 more distant nephews and nieces. After Bill was wounded on Bataan, he spent more than a month at a Bataan battlefield hospital recovering from the bullet wounds that knocked him off the tank. He was released in March 1942, and as it turns out, that release may have prevented an even earlier death. Because around Easter 1942, Japanese air forces, disregarding the battlefield hospital's giant red cross that was visible from the air, bombed the mostly open air hospital. The attack decimated the hospital and killed many patients. But while the bombs dropped, a miracle occurred. A miracle for which a Catholic chaplain would be nominated for sainthood. More on that next time. This is Left Behind. Thanks for listening. You can find pictures, maps, and sources about Willibald Bianchi's story on the Left Behind Podcast Facebook page and on my website. The links are in the show description. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Spreading the word about this podcast lets me continue sharing these amazing stories. Left Behind is researched, written, and produced by me, Anastasia Harmon. Voiceovers by Tyler Harmon and Paul Sutherland. Dramatizations are based on historical research, although some creative liberty is taken with dialogue. And I'll be back next time with a Catholic priest who, on a whim, joined the U.S. Army as it retreated from Bataan. Bataan.